When you look at the history of almost every medium, you almost always find a very strange phase of early development. The formative years of almost all new technologies were periods defined by awkward experimentation and unintentional misfires, created before any widespread rules or conventions had been established. The creative decisions made in the early days of film or photography may have made sense within the context of the technical limits of the day and of their proprietor's limited experience, but when viewed from a modern perspective, they often retroactively strike us as bizarre and otherworldly. Hence the unnerving detachment one feels when looking at old photographs, the dreamlike or sometimes nightmarish reality you see presented in early silent films, or even the creepy feeling of estrangement one gets when stumbling upon old cryptic web content. And no stranger to this phenomenon is the history of early 3D gaming. There's always been something strangely surreal to me about early polygonal games, and it's a feeling I've always struggled to define, but there are just some games from the mid to late 90s that just give me the weirdest vibe. By the start of the mid 90s, 2D gaming had had a meteoric rise. What started with nothing more than abstract clusters of pixels had since evolved into expressive and detailed worlds rich with animated characters and expressive, defined art styles. However, at the time, this achievement was somewhat taken for granted, as the gaming world had collectively set their sights on something bigger, 3D gaming. And this was new and uncharted territory, one where all the established conventions of 2D gaming would be rendered obsolete and all the rules would have to be rewritten. And what resulted from this spitfire of evolving ideas and concepts is this collection of bizarrely dreamlike and uncanny experiences. When I play some of these games, I'm often filled with this unsettling sense that nothing I'm seeing is quite what it should be. This pervasive atmosphere of mixed feelings. Feelings like entrapment, isolation, and anxiety, just to name a few. And if you grew up around this time or played a lot of games from this era, I think you might know what I mean. Granted, the feeling I'm describing is very hard to validate empirically. It is just a feeling, after all. However, if you want evidence, look no further than the tidal wave of horror games made in the style of early polygonal 3D, which we've gotten over the past few years. Some may argue this is just a cheap workaround to low development budgets, or just a nostalgic reveling of the 90s, but I disagree. I think developers are making a conscious artistic decision to style their horror games this way, and they're doing it for a reason. It's not just because it's trendy or easy to do so, but because it genuinely adds something distinct to the experience. This feeling may not be present in every game, mind you, but within countless games of this era, there truly is something silently disturbing to behold. And it's this feeling I want to explore, but I can only do so through generalizations for so long. It's really impossible to talk about without reference to a specific game. So let's look at one. One of the cornerstones of this unnerving, intangible phenomenon, the original Silent Hill for PS1. Obviously, Silent Hill is unnerving, it's a survival horror game, and you wouldn't be wrong in making this point. Silent Hill was and still is a legitimately scary game, but that's not the whole story. Because no other Silent Hill game has the vibe that Silent Hill 1 has, not even the direct PS2 sequels. It doesn't matter if you're looking at the later Silent Hill games or any modern survival horror games. Nothing else makes me feel alone and vulnerable like this does. There's a real lifelessness to Silent Hill 1. A feeling that within this fog-shrouded town, you, the player, are the only thing that really exists. 
By comparison, you look at a modern game like Resident Evil 7, and it showcases a convincingly grimy, lived-in world. But by contrast, the original Silent Hill feels incredibly sterile and untouched. The town you're presented with feels almost uninhabitable, like a town that's never actually been lived in. As horrific and disgustingly detailed as, say, the necromorphs in Dead Space may be, you could at least identify them as mutant reanimated corpses. You could describe their anatomy in detail if you wanted to. Whereas in Silent Hill 1, it's never clear what the monsters you're up against are supposed to be. Are they deformed humans? Or are they some sort of fleshy hellspawn? Or are they something else entirely? The game doesn't tell you, nor are the models detailed enough to give you an accurate picture on your own. The differences are even clearer when you put it up against Silent Hill 2, which released just two years later. One of the most frequent discussions about 2 are its unsettling cutscenes. The cinematic visuals in the sequel almost looked lifelike, but just as often, they're uncanny and unnatural. Real enough to pass as human, but also distinctly artificial in a way that's confusing to your mind. And even outside the cinematics, there's a very subtle feeling of detachment between the characters as they interact. They feel genuine, but also completely alien at the same time. But now by contrast, let's look at Silent Hill 1's interactions. Finally, someone else who's okay. Who are you? My name's Lisa Garland. What's yours? Cold and inhuman are just two words that come to mind. What we see here only resemble humans in the vaguest sense of the word. The Silent Hill sequels may have felt off, but at a base level they at least give me impression of actual human exchanges. Whereas with Silent Hill 1, I feel like I'm watching two dolls being posed inside of a dollhouse. They're both uncanny, but in very different ways. Because if Silent Hill 2 were an eerie, half-human android, imitating a living human but without the essential nuance, Silent Hill 1 would be a hollow, wooden puppet. A gross imitation, creepy not so much in its botched attempts at acting human, but in its pure lifelessness. This energy pervades almost every area of Silent Hill 1, and is the main reason to me why it's the scariest in the series. But I want to stress that most of these effects were not intentional. Silent Hill is very much a game defined by its technical limitations. The lifelessness of the world I talked about is primarily a symptom of the PS1's inability to create realistic environments. The ambiguous nature of the monsters is a result of the game's naturally low poly count. It's a sort of unintentional minimalism, where everything either feels dead or ambiguous in a way that makes you uneasy. So while Team Silent definitely intended for the game to be scary, they did so on a deeper level than I think they could have predicted. And while this certainly affects horror games, you very often see this exact same process occurring in non-horror games. In fact, there's a perfect example in recent history. Developer Scott Coffin, creator of Five Nights at Freddy's, had earlier made several non-horror games using the same character modeling software as he did for his aforementioned hit, unintentionally creating uncanny animatronic-like characters. And it was only after the reception to these games that Cawthon realized the potential of utilizing this effect for horror. So even in a more contemporary context, we can see this exact process, technical limitation leading to unintentionally creepy results. And given the lack of established technical standards for 3D in its early years, it makes perfect sense that in the 90s you would have a high concentration of games like this. Which leads me to what may be the holy grail of unexpectedly surreal video games. A game you've probably played. Super Mario 64. Now, in the broadest strokes, is Mario 64 a creepy game? And the answer is no. But at the same time, it really is. 
It just has the weirdest vibe, man. As a kid and as an adult, there is something in Mario 64 that really makes me feel off. As upbeat and lively as levels like Bomb on Battlefield or Thwomp's Fortress are, huge portions of this game have this strangely ominous and claustrophobic vibe. And not even necessarily the quote unquote spooky areas like Big Boo's Haunt, but even unexpected places like Peach's Castle that feel disturbingly desolate. Now, if you play this game as a kid, there were definitely moments that we can all agree upon being scary, the most well-known being the infamous eel in Jolly Rogers Bay. This giant creature that completely dwarfs you with this dead look in his eyes and a design that feels very out of place with the wider art style. In reality, all he sort of does is just swim around, but you get this strange premonition around the eel like he's about to suddenly come out and devour you even though that's clearly not in his programming. But even outside of these pronounced, maybe intentionally scary moments like the piano jump scare, it has a very similar vibe to Silent Hill where nothing feels alive in the world of Mario 64. Like the creepiest thing for me as a kid was Hazy Maze Cave. Again, not in the actual core spooky cave part, but as you go deeper, descending further and further underground. The music suddenly becomes distant and you come to this lake, only to see this giant creature slowly swimming in the distance. I can never say why, but this thing always bugged me. Sure, when you get close you see it's friendly and doesn't hurt you, but it still put me off. It just looked so deceased and robotic. The thing is barely even animated, it just mechanically swims back and forth like an old animatronic at an amusement park. Contrast this to his appearance in Mario Odyssey, where he's emotive and fully animated and makes perfect sense within the game's environment. What should be cute and welcoming, on a subconscious level, feels hostile. Even other friendly NPCs in the game feel weirdly disincarnate. Like the toads who are just sort of there in the castle, near invisible until you approach them. Like they're just projections with no actual presence within the castle walls. And so many of Mario 64's worlds just feel deserted and empty. In fact, they don't even really feel like worlds. They're more like geometry floating in space, stuck in a sort of Twilight Zone-esque limbo where things just happen. Mario out of nowhere shrinks into this cage in the courtyard and suddenly he's in what feels like an entirely new dimension. Where is Mario supposed to be right now? I'm not sure, but it's definitely not in the courtyard. And the game has so many of these dreamlike moments with things like morphing paintings or never-ending staircases. And I get it, it doesn't need to make sense, it is just a cartoon. But is it just me or is there somehow something very violent to when Mario drowns or is buried alive in sand? It may be cartoony, but the feelings it produces feel uncharacteristically real, hitting way closer to home than they should. And I almost guarantee you this effect was not intentional on Nintendo's part. The title screen, the music, the NPC dialogue, they all read typical Happy Mario Adventure, and they clearly indicate the tone that Nintendo was actually going for. And this, in essence, is the vibe of games of this era. I think these are all unintentional byproducts of the technical restrictions of the mid to late 90s. I have considered that some of this may just be a result of me having played Mario 64 as a kid while my mind was a lot more impressionable, and while I'll concede that that may be a factor here, I don't think that's all there is to it. The main reason being that there were tons of early 3D games that I played that didn't have this vibe. Banjo-Kazooie is another game I grew up with that is practically a spiritual successor to Mario 64, yet it doesn't share this tone. The NPCs are big and animated, and the worlds are stylized and densely packed with enemies and life. As a kid, it felt like a fully animated cartoon world and never felt menacing or ominous. And even if it did, there are plenty of things that scared me as a kid that no longer bother me. I used to think Gremlins was scary, but now I generally consider it to be a good time. However, there will never be a reality where Courage the Cowardly Dog or Large Marge are not uncomfortably surreal. They're not nearly as scary now, obviously, 
As an adult, I can regulate those emotions in a way that I couldn't as a kid. But that lingering uneasiness will always be there. And lastly, there are plenty of games I only recently played in my adulthood that 100% carry that same unmistakable oppressive tone. So, with all of this established, I'd like to present my theory for why these feelings exist in the first place. And for the sake of ease, I'm going to refer to this effect as virtual horror. As I alluded to earlier, I think of it as a type of the uncanny, not unlike the effect of a creepy doll or android. But unlike with a doll or android, there's a very different dynamic between the subject and object. As while something like an android or mannequin can be viewed as external to oneself, video games are more enveloping and immersive. The dividing line between the player and the game is often blurred, meaning the feeling one gets is far more omnipresent. Much like cosmic horror, virtual horror is a very general feeling, one that is usually prompted by a multitude of subtle environmental factors, rather than a single, isolatable factor like a doll's face being weirdly half-realistic. And so it's this collection of unique effects that I really want to individually isolate and explore, and I think it's a valuable pursuit, as while many of these effects first came about in this bygone era, Almost all of them are still applicable and ready to be utilized in modern game design, provided the developers are willing to self-impose certain artistic limits. And so with that goal established, I think this is a good place to stop for now. But stick around for episodes 2 and 3. There we'll go point by point what made virtual horror what it is. We'll spend episode 2 doing a deep analysis of the many effects we've already talked about, so by the final episode, we'll be ready to explore the deeper, darker, and less obvious consequences of this period. So, stay tuned. Hey guys, I just want to thank you first of all for watching this video. It took a ton of time to make, and so I really appreciate you all watching it to the very end. Make sure to subscribe to get informed of future videos coming soon, including episode 2 of this series if you're watching this close to upload. A big shout out to my friend Gabo Davin for creating the VFX sequences for this video. He's a good man, I would trust him with my life, and you can check out his other animation videos on his channel, which I've linked in the description below. And another thank you to all the fellow creators who let me use their gameplay footage. This video featured dozens and dozens of games, and I simply didn't have time to record extensive footage for all of them myself, and so a big thank you to them. And again, thank you for watching, and stay tuned for more videos coming soon.